Uh, hi Bethel, I haven't made a video for a week or so, uh, so I thought I'd get back in touch. I've got my coffee and hey, I've even dressed a, a little smarter for you today. I just wanted to touch base uh, to give us some more food for thought, some things that God's been putting on my heart for us. Um, if you're not from Bethel, uh, but you find yourself joining us and watching this video, then great. Uh, you're really welcome. I hope that there's something in there that is a challenge for you as well. Bethel, first of all, I, I want to say thank you. Thank you for being such an amazing church family. Thank you for praying and for caring and for loving one another. Uh, some of our family are going through some truly awful things at the moment, and you're rallying around in every way that is safe and possible. So thank you. Keep going, keep praying, keep being sensible as you do, and keep staying safe. We're really starting to see some of the consequences now of the coronavirus pandemic, aren't we? Not only on our world and our country, not just on the economy and business, but also emotionally, psychologically, the effect that it's having on our minds and our hearts. One way it's doing that is by eroding that sense of security that we place in things, those things that we put our trust in, whether or not we realise it, those things that we make little gods in our lives. If I said the word idol, then maybe you'd think of uh, Indiana Jones or Tomb Raider. Well, in Isaiah's time, which is around 750 years before Jesus came, uh, it was really common for the surrounding cultures to make idols and worship them. And sometimes God's own people would be unwise enough to get sucked in and worship idols, to make false gods and offer worship to them. Well, in Isaiah chapter 40, God takes a bit of a sarcastic swipe at these gods. And those who worship them, he says, to whom can you compare God? To what image are you going to liken him? A craftsman casts an idol, a metalsmith then overlays it with gold and forges silver chains for it. To make a contribution, someone selects wood that won't rot. And then he seeks a skilled craftsman to make an idol that won't fall over. Well... Through God's sarcasm there, he's saying this, you're going to look at something made of wood that you, you can shape so that at least it doesn't fall over onto the floor, or something that looks pretty because you've coated it in metal or gold or silver, and that's enough for you to say, yeah, I'll make that my God, I'll, I'll worship that. You're going to stand that up next to me, the, the true and living God, and make a comparison we well, you know as long as people have been around, we have always been tempted to turn from God, to make an idol of something that will not last, and then choose to worship it. And you're going to say to me perhaps, well, of course I don't do that. I'd never do that. But let me ask you some questions. What is it that you have made an idol of in the place of God? What are you in danger of putting in that place in your heart that is reserved only for God? What do you worship? We all worship something, but what is it that you worship? See, this really isn't a matter of making something from gold or wood and then putting it in the corner of your room and treating it like a good luck charm. It's about your heart, what you give your heart to. So another way of asking this question is this, what are your first thoughts when you wake up? And what are the last thoughts that go through your mind before you go to sleep? And when you wake up at 3.30am like I am at the moment, what are the things that buzz through your mind that, that stop you from sleeping? What consumes you? What makes you unsatisfied until you've got a grasp, got a hold of it? Here are some things that we can easily accidentally make idols of. We can make idols at the moment of government and democracy and political systems and ideologies. We can make idols of possessions, of family and security. We can make idols of, of being useful, of being productive, of, of our work and projects. We can make an idol of finance and money and health. And yes, we can even make an idol of something like the NHS. We can make idols of romantic relationships and sex, friendships and companionship. We can make idols of spirituality and mindfulness and peace. And we can make idols of hobbies and sports and Netflix. All of these things can become the source of our focus and our devotion. They can become our reasons for being. Do you notice that none of those things in and of themselves are bad? 
God gave us every one of those things as good gifts. The Bible is clear that they're the evidence that he is a God of love and grace for the whole world. But if you make those good gifts gods instead of God, well, that's when the problems come. And it's so easy. We, we so subtly allow these things to become our idols, our, our little gods, that we desire them more than we desire God himself. We give them more importance than they are, are truly due and we put them in a place that is only reserved for God in our hearts. We worship these things. And just like God is a God of promises, so all of these mini gods, these false gods, offer promises to us too. They say things like this, I will make you more attractive. I'll fulfill the loneliness that you feel. I'll give you a sense of security. I'll make you popular. I'll give you a long and satisfying life. I'll make you feel less like an outsider, more in with the in crowd. I'll bring you happiness. The Christian author Mike Reeves says this, seek God and you will find happiness. Seek happiness and it will slip through your fingers. I'll give you an example from my own life. For years, uh, I wanted to be some kind of rock star. That's what I thought would make me happy. I had a band and we were popular on the local scene and people liked our stuff and things seemed to be working out fairly well. And music held this promise just just out of grasp of, of the potential for fame, for popularity, for creative satisfaction, maybe even naively some money. But I think God knew that it was becoming an idol in my life, something that I was putting all of my desires and hopes in. Music was making promises to me that it couldn't keep. And really it was a mercy that that, that didn't end up going anywhere for me. And arguably it was a mercy as well for those who would have had to end up listening to all the music I made. But look, if you're going to make something the chief object of your desire, I'm telling you, stand back and just look. Be sure that the promises that they're making are not shallow and empty ones. You know, I know of nothing that can take the place of God that won't eventually screw you over or leave you feeling bad or worse, dissatisfied. If you make them your God, if you put them in a place that that they aren't meant to have, they will let you down. Maybe you're experiencing that already during this time. Those things that you put your security in suddenly don't seem so solid. Your idols aren't satisfying you in the ways that they promised. You finally binge watched enough free Netflix series or you've read enough books or had enough phone calls and video meetings that that you realise you've just ended up back where you started. The things that you desired haven't fulfilled the promises that they might have. And that's what it comes down to, I think, desire, what we desire, the inclination of our hearts to want something so bad that you end up focusing all your attention and time and heart and mind on them. And then when you do that, you realise suddenly how far they fall short. The American pastor John Piper observed, this pandemic is showing us graphically and painfully that nothing in this world gives us the security and satisfaction that we can only find in the infinite greatness and worth of Jesus. And here's the point, here's the heart of the matter, the thing I really want to remind you of, or if not remind you, maybe encourage you to think about for the first time. Jesus, who is God, is the one who will never let you down. Jesus is the one in whom all of our desires can be perfectly met. And Jesus is the one who promises and then over delivers. If you're lonely, he is there. If you lack purpose, he will provide you with purpose. If you're broken and hurting, he will heal you. If you are suffering, he will walk with you through it. If you're financially struggling, he will not leave you alone. He will provide for you, maybe miraculously or maybe through a church family. If you are vulnerable, he will strengthen you. If you're scared, he will calm you and bring you comfort and peace. If you are desperate for happiness and love, and these I think are the ones that really speak to the hearts of every one of us, he will love you in a way that no other person or thing or achievement ever could. In fact, he's already proved that. He proved it in the greatest act of love that has ever been displayed. 
Jesus said this, No one has greater love than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. You can read that in John chapter 15 verse 13. If you want to be Jesus' friend, then to know his love, you just need to walk with him and live in it, obey and abide in it. The Apostle John wrote this, By this the love of God is revealed, that God has sent his one and only Son into the world so that we may live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, God took the initiative. God loved us, so God sent his Son to die. God allowed Jesus to be the one who would atone for our sins, that is, to pay the price for our rebellion against God. This isn't soppy, romantic love. It's not obviously erotic, sexual love. It's not a casual love that gets bored and then just moves on. It's not manipulative. It's not demanding. It doesn't require that you earn it. How could it? For the Bible says, while we were still helpless, at just the right time, Christ died for not the godly, but the ungodly. God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Those verses are in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8. You see, this love that God displayed, this is costly, sacrificial love. It's love that never gives up. It's love that goes all the way. This love was, was put out on a plate and offered to you when you still hated God, when you didn't care one thing about him. So what does it take to know this love? Well, the answer is simple. It takes faith. And even this faith that is required to know the love of God is a gift that he gives you. As you look to Jesus, as you see him in all his beauty and wonder and glory, as you realise that not a single one of your idols can compare to him, well then God gives you the faith to redirect all of those desires. All of the desires of your heart can be repointed to Jesus. That's how we know God, by looking at the face of Jesus. So if you're listening to this and you're not a Christian, well, fair dues to you. God bless you for coming this far down the road with me in this talk. I I wonder what you make of this. I'd love to know. I'd love to hear from you. What are the things that you worship? And what I mean by that is, what are the things that you place your heart's desires in? I'd love for you to ask, do you think they can really fulfil those promises? Will they ever let you down? Have they always been there for you? When you get those things that you long for, do you finally feel fulfilled and complete? Or is there still that sense of satisfaction that that is waiting to be fulfilled? Do they give you a solid foundation for you to base your life on? Because I think that's what it takes. I want nothing less than a never broken promise that will carry me through not just this life, but the next. So please do feel free to get in touch with me if you uh, have some thoughts on that. I'd love to hear them. And if you already follow Jesus, well, how is God speaking to you right now? See, every single one of us have times when our loves, our desires, they get directed elsewhere. We get sucked in by the promises of those other things and we lose sight of Jesus. If that's you, I'd love for you to use those diagnostic questions that I asked earlier on, those questions to ask yourself honestly, what do you desire the most in life at the moment? What do you pursue with all your time and your heart and your money? What has taken the place of Jesus as your first love, or at least what is at risk of taking the place of Jesus? My prayer is simply this, that as you take a moment to think on these verses and these things that we've talked about, that you will see more and more the massive love that God has for you and how he displayed that love so beautifully in the death of his son. You see, if Jesus really died to atone and pay the price for our sin, then surely he's a God worth following. A God who dies for you, who has already done everything that you need. He's not going to let you down when it comes to keeping his promises for for your needs that are now and are still to come. He's not going to let you down. So should we pray to him now? Father, we confess that so often and in so many different ways, 
we're inclined to make idols in our hearts, to direct our worship to people and ideas and things that we know won't satisfy us or last. We so often stray and look for the easy routes to comfort, security and happiness. But Lord, none of those things keep their promises to us. So please help us today to redirect our eyes towards Jesus, that we might see your great love for us displayed in him. Help us to see the cross more clearly and your love poured out for us there in the death of your son. Help us to take to heart the words of that old hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Friends, that's my prayer for us today, that we would do that now and in the days and weeks to come, that we would keep looking at our own hearts and seeing where we're putting our hope. Please stay safe uh, and please be in touch. I'd love to hear from you. But for now, uh, I hope you've got to the end of your coffee cup. I just about have. Uh, peace for me and uh, we'll speak again soon.